Um, so I'd just like to welcome you. Uh, my name is Paul Linden. I'm the principal investigator of the TAPAS uh, network project, Tackling Air Pollution at School. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, we are having uh, weekly seminars uh, on issues associated with air quality uh, in schools. Um, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. The first is, of course, that uh, uh, this uh, um, session of Zoom is being recorded. So if you don't wish to appear in the rec recording, please keep your camera off and stay on mute. And in any case, during the course of the, of the presentation, please stay on mute. Um, and put any questions you have for Karina, our speaker, in the chat, which uh, I will relay at the end of, of her talk. Anyway, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Corinne Mandal today. Uh, Corinne earned her PhD in environmental chemistry from Rennes in France, and she works on human exposure to chemicals in indoor environments, first at Inneris and now at CSTB, as you can see on her slide. Now, she leads the French Indoor Air Quality Observatory created by the French government in 2001, uh, which carry out national, nationwide surveys on IAQ in buildings and collaborates with the World Health Organization and the European Joint Research Center on projects related to indoor air quality. And she's the current president of the International Society for Indoor Air Quality. So it's uh, a great pleasure to have you uh, here today, Corinne, and uh, we look forward very much to hearing your talk, which is about indoor air quality in schools from knowledge to actions. So over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to, to be with you today. Thank you to the TAPAS Network for this invitation. This is also my, my great pleasure to, to be with you. So I will discuss about um, indoor air quality in school today, uh, the, some results from our observatory. And uh, first I, I will let you know a little bit more about this uh, observatory very briefly. Then I will introduce our, national, our nationwide school survey uh, carried out between 2013 and 2017. And I will finish with the, the solutions, uh, reduce the sources, promote ventilation, regulate, raise awareness also. So let's start with a few words about the, the French Indoor Air Quality Observatory. So this observatory was created in 2001. We are celebrating our 20 years old this year. Uh, our objective is mainly to coordinate and develop indoor air research activities at a national scale. It will be illustrated with the school survey I will show you in, in a minute. Uh, the objective is to improve knowledge on indoor air quality in buildings. Uh, mainly for, uh, to support public policies. The, 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 our observatory was built by the French government to help them in uh, doing new regulation or doing prevention policies. So the first target is public policies, but we are also uh, targeting the professional, health professionals, building professionals, and also the general public. Uh, we are only supported by public finances uh, from three ministries, the ministries of uh, housing, health, and environment and two public health agencies, the ADEM, the Agency for Energy Management, and the ANSES, the Agen Agency for Environmental um, Health, are also supporting uh, our work. So what, what do we do every day? So we mainly uh, perform nationwide monitoring campaigns uh, to measure indoor air quality and to collect descriptive data that helps us to understand this uh, indoor air pollution. Uh, so I will illustrate in a minute what is a nationwide uh, survey in France, but we also do specific studies. Uh, I will also give you an example to study a specific questions. Uh, we do regularly review of literature and we collect uh, what has also done, uh, what has also been done in other countries. Uh, this is useful for us to help us uh, our deciding our next survey. We, we are doing permanent um, review and permanent ranking of pollutants. And um, our four mission is the dissemination. So we are participating to local, national, or international conferences uh, as today. So I'm once again very happy to, to, to explain you what we are doing in this observatory. And our studies are organized around six programs. 
um, targeted to, to buildings. The, the first one was dwellings, because this is the place where we are spending most of our time. But we have also a specific program on school and daycare centers, on office buildings, uh, on low energy buildings, because there, there are specific questions about these buildings. Uh, more recently, we started a program on hospitals and elderly homes, and we have uh, also a cross-cutting program on communication, and training and education. So let's come to the topic of the day, the indoor air quality in schools. So we, we performed this school survey between 2013 and 2017. Uh, what is very specific to our study is that we are um, choosing the buildings where we are doing the measurement randomly. We are we have a, a, a random selection uh, in the buildings we are studying. So here, the school. So we, we add the, the file of the 50, uh, 52,000 schools across France, uh, mainland France, the overseas territories are excluded. So we have the list of these schools. And in this list, we randomly selected 300 schools and we stratified the sample to, um, we, we separated the nursery schools and the elementary school urban and rural and uh, the cli uh, cli climatic zone. We want to be sure to, to go everywhere in France. That's why our sample is stratified on these three parameters. And uh, so why, why, three and, why 300 uh, schools? Because we calculated the number, the number based on the precision we are expecting on the measured concentration. And so we studied, um, we targeted the 10% accuracy on median concentration of uh, VOCs. This, is, this calculation leads us to instrument um, 300, uh, 300 schools and exactly we, we went in 308 classrooms and, six, and 602 classrooms, 308 schools and 602 classrooms. So this sampling design allo each allows us to extrapolate to the, full, to the whole country because it's each school that is instrumented as a sampling weight so the results measure the measurement result in these schools uh, is extrapolated to the, the full uh, the full sample of schools in France. That's why um, we are. That's why the ministry the ministries are working with us because they are they have data uh, for the whole country for the whole building stock of schools or of dwellings or offices. So coming coming to the parameters that we measured uh, in this school, so we the measurement were done over one week from Monday to Friday to the school week, and uh, so you see on the on the picture the type of, um, of, of device equipment we we have in each classroom. So we did online measurements uh, during this week: carbon dioxide, temperature, relative humidity. Uh, we measured also particle, fine particle and noise. The microphone you see here is, is for noise measurement. So we uh, actually, we, we, we are the observatory on, on indoor air quality, but we try to uh, uh, expand the scope to, to consider indoor environment quality. So also noise and, and light and, uh, and other parameters. So regarding air sample, we had both two types. We had the active sampling, so the we pumps in the, 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 at the bottom, the, the inox box was with the, the pumps avoid noise so and we with pumps we sample the pm 2.5 and semi volatile organic compounds and we also have passive samplers for vocs aldehydes and nitrogen dioxide and these passive samplers are also outdoor to have a um, reference concentration from the, the schoolyard and we know that uh, children at schools and also at home are exposed to settled dust and some compounds in settled dust are very are toxic and uh, led to important exposure. That's why we, we sampled also the settled dust with two techniques. One with uh, one technique is, is the wipe. We use the wipe to sample the, the metals, especially the lead, because we know that there is a correlation bet between lead measured in, with wipe and lead in blood. But we also did some measure sampling with a vacuum cleaner to sample other metals and semi-volatile organic compounds. And we did punctual measurements, so illuminance were measured on the table and on the board. We measured lead in paint with X-ray fluorescence, and we measured electromagnetic fields. So a large number of, of measurements. I, I will show you the results in, in a few minutes. And we've all, in parallel of all these measurements, we have uh, questionnaires to describe the building, to describe the, the, the environment of the building, to describe the classroom, uh, occupancy, we have time activity patterns, uh, activities done in the classrooms and uh, we collected also the perception of teachers. So all these descriptive data 
from the questionnaire help us to understand the, the, the indoor concentration that, that we measure. So let's come right now to the results. So we, we observe positive things. We, we observe in French schools low nitrogen dioxide concentration and also low VOC concentrations, lower at schools uh, compared to, to dwellings. And the four uh, critical issues that we uh, observed in parallel uh, are regarding fine particles, PM2.5, semi-volatile organic compounds, the lack of ventilation, that is very common, maybe the same situation in UK, and lead in paint. So I, I will give you a little bit more detail for each parameter regarding first the PM2.5, so the median concentration was at 18 microgram per cubic meter, uh, per cubic meter. so the, the guideline value of WHO, okay, it's a long-term guideline value, but if we compare the one-week measurement with this long-term guideline value, it was exceeded in nearly all the classrooms, 96%. So it's, when we compare our result with a result from other schools in, in Europe, this is not particularly high, but nevertheless, we are a bit surprised because we have the same level in, in schools compared to dwellings. But in schools, we are not smoking, we are not cooking, we are not using incense or burning candles. So uh, we, we think that PM is a real problem in schools because it should be lower than, than at home. But it probably comes from, from outdoor, from the traffic. So this was the first, um, first alert. Second point, second yeah, prob problematic point is about semi-volatile organic compounds. So we, we measured 52 SVOCs, pesticides, synthetic musk, polychlorobiphenyls, phthalates, uh, both in the air and in settled dust. So you see the, the cartridge used for air to sample gas and particulate phase. And you see on the right the, 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 the devices that we use at the, at the, at the end of the, the vacuum cleaner. We have a cellulose cartridge to collect the dust just at the beginning, not to pollute the dust with, uh, with phthalates from the, from the vacuum cleaner, from the plastic. So here you see the, um, on these two graphics, to graph the, the median concentration of some SVOCs. And um, so uh, some were detected in 100% of the classroom. So phthalates, uh, synthetic musk, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, lindane, that is a neurotoxic pesticide, they were detected in, in all the samples in all the classrooms. So we were also a bit surprised to have a, such a high detection rate of these uh, semi-volatile compounds and uh, the most uh, so highly detected and also in high concentration, especially for phthalates. You see that in the air, uh, the median concentration of phthalates, but also of musk are of over one nanogram per cubic meter. And in settled dust, phthalates also predominant with cons median concentration over uh, one um, microgram per, per gram of dust. The third point is the ventilation. We, we, we have, I guess maybe as in UK, we have a, a limited number of schools that are equipped with mechanical ventilation, only one quarter of schools. So the three quarters of classrooms are just relying on window opening. And we know that, that window opening is not so common for many reasons, safety reason for energy saving. So we, we created an index that is called the ICON index, air stuff index, index, based on the CO2 concentration to, to have an easy rating system of the, the, the air stuffiness. If, if the air is stuffy at school, it means that the, pollu the other pollutants are also in the classroom and that indoor air quality is bad. So it, we created this index to be easy to understand by the, the teachers or the school managers. So this index is based on the CO2 concentration. I will not enter into the details. And it's from zero, non, no, no, air, no stuffy air, to five extreme. It means that all the times during all the measurements, the concentration are above uh, 1,700 ppm. So when we look at the distribution of the ICON in index in French schools, uh, we observe that 40% of schools have at least one classroom with a high uh, air stuff index, index. That means equal to four or five. So it's a high proportion of classrooms that have a, a, poor, a poor ventilation. So poor ventilation means meaning poor indoor air quality. And the fourth point uh, is about lead. So we, we, at the beginning of the campaign, it was not sure to include lead because it's an old pollutant. 
and it's not used anymore in, in building materials or in, in paints particularly. But during the pilot survey, we observed that one classroom out of 10 had, uh, had still lead in, in paints. So we, meant we, keep, we kept the measurement of lead with uh, X-ray fluorescence and we observed that 15% of schools in France have at least one classroom with uh, lead in paints and uh, deteriorated paints, so it means accessible for children. We know that they are taking the ships of paint and uh, it's sweet, so they, they may inge ingest this paint. And uh, with a concentration over one milligram per, per square centimeter. So, so it's, it's an important rate and mainly from the, the paints, but also it can be also found in, um, on, on windows, on the windows frame or on shutters or on, on, on furniture also. So the good thing is that volatile organic compounds, even if they are detected in most of the classrooms, so 80% of the classroom have formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, hexaldehyde, benzene, uh, detection rate were lower for phenol and for perchloroethylene and hexane also. Uh, and we have guidelines value in France for only two chemicals uh, in indoor air for benzene and for formaldehyde. And the guideline value was exceeded in 17% of classrooms for benzene and in 23% of classrooms for formaldehyde. So it, it's still an important percentage, but not so high. So the values are not ex exceeded so, so, so often. And compared to dwellings, you, you see the, so the blue bars are the median in schools and the green bars are the median in dwellings. Uh, so we did a similar survey uh, in dwellings earlier in between 2003 and 2005 and all the concentration in schools are lower so maybe it also may be due to the time because it, it was older and the concentration were higher uh, especially in organic solvents but it's it's a good point uh, concentration are lower uh, at schools compared to, to dwellings so except for formaldehyde we have around the same median value around 20 microgram per cubic meter exaldehyde also and PM 2.5, as I was mentioning earlier, we have the same median value as in dwellings, what is a bit surprising because we, we have no combustion in, in classrooms. And um, we, we studied also the, the combined exposure at, at, of pollutants. So you, we measured many compounds. So we, we did clustering to identify the, the group of classrooms that have the same pollutants in air, both in air and in, in dust. And uh, we, we identified, we, we characterized five types of pollution in classrooms. So we have 21% of classrooms with high concentration of the pollutants, both in air and in dust. Uh, we have 19% of classrooms with high concentrations, but only in air, and 24% of classrooms with high concentration, but only in dust. 17% uh, of classrooms are only polluted with phthalates. And, um, and only, I would say, only 19% of classrooms have low concentration, both in air and dust. So uh, in brief, we have uh, most of the classrooms that are multi-polluted. There are many pollutants, uh, both in air and dust. So this is an important result because we are more and more speaking about exposure to mixtures and combined effects of, on health. So it's important to know that, yes, we are exposed to children at schools are exposed to these mixtures of pollutants. So now we are still, we have lots of data that has not been analyzed yet regarding thermal comfort, noise, light. And we, we, are, we are right now work looking at the determinants of, of indoor pollutants such as lindane, because lindane is, is forbidden since around 20 years in France, but we still have lindane in, in air and, and dust. So we try to understand what are the sources and we do the same, um, same analysis for formaldehyde. So now the, the last part and the, maybe the more, the more useful, what are the solutions? What do we do to improve indoor air quality in, in classrooms? So the, the, first, um, the, first, um, the first tool, the first measure is source control. We need to limit the, the sources, the emission sources in, in classrooms. And I, I show you here a, a French regulation, not specific to, to classrooms. This is for all the buildings. Uh, since 2013, it's, it's mandatory in France for the, the building materials and the decoration products to have to, to label. So we have a label, as you see on the picture, with a, a letter from A plus to C uh, indicating the, the emission of 10 VOCs uh, 
and aldehydes and TVOC. So uh, the, the producer of these products, they need to do uh, measurement in, in emission chambers or they need to show that they don't have these chemicals in the composition. And uh, according to the emission, the concentration in the chamber, uh, each compound is classified between C, high emission or A plus, low emission. And at the end, the, the worst note for one compound gives the final note to the product. So it's, it's useful. We can, a consumer can choose a, a, low, uh, a lower a product with lower emission. And now in, in, when the people are building new schools in France, the, they, all, they all want A plus products only. So this is a way to, to reduce the, the sources of pollutants. And um, among other sources, there are also the cleaning products. And we observed in our studies that cleaning products are, we think it's a high contributor of, of indoor VOCs in classrooms. And I show you here the results of another survey, a survey we did earlier for the ministry, um, where we, we did a building audit in 310 schools and, and daycare centers across France. And we asked for all the cleaning products that were used in these schools. And uh, we, we, we observed that a, a high number of, of products are used. 500, 584 products uh, were uh, listed uh, from one to seven products used per building, on average three or four products. So it, it's a lot, a lot of different products used to clean soil or, or windows and the, the, the boards. Uh, and then to, to try to analyze and to, see, to describe the substances that are in these products, we looked at the safety data sheets. Uh, and um, so first, the first result was that these safety data sheets are not available. We managed to collect only 37% of the safety data sheets from the product. So information is missing, even if we are, people are paying attention to cleaning products, that we don't know what, what is in the product. And then we, we listed from the safety data sheets that we had the substances that were mentioned. And we know that there is high limitation because the, the, compo the exact composition is not mentioned, only the, the, more, uh, the, the substances that are the more concentrated. But nevertheless, we listed 152 different substances um, in these products. And then the last step of this study was to, this study was to to look for the, the classification, the danger classification available in, in different classification in the world. So we looked at uh, the, the classif classification and labeling system in Europe. We look also at the International Agency on, for Research on Cancer, the classification on cancer. And for each of the substance, we, we look for the, for the danger and, this and we observe that half of the substances in these products are classified as irritant uh, by the, the EU classification system. One among these substances is classified as carcinogen, carcinogen in group one, so sure uh, carcinogen for humans, and two are uh, considered as endocrine disruptors according to, to the European Commission proposal. So we, have pro we, have, we are introducing cleaning products in schools that have irritant substances and also sometimes carcinogen and endocrine disruptors. So we really need uh, to, to reduce cleaning products in schools. And uh, with the pandemic now, we have more and more disinfection products. We, we, it's a balance, of course. We need to, to fight against the virus, but we also need to pay attention not to introduce too many chemicals uh, in, in schools and in, in buildings in general. The, the second way to improve indoor air quality is to, to, to manage air, air change rate, to really to improve ventilation. And, 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 but we know that mechanical ventilation is not common in, in schools, at least in France. Uh, and mechanical ventilation also has some limits because uh, it must be maintained, well, well, well installed, well maintained, and, and sometimes not the case. But this is, this is efficient when it's well well. well well maintained and well installed, but it's not everywhere and it's not in many classrooms. So the, the other way to improve, uh, to, to change air is to open the window. But as I was mentioning earlier, the teachers, when we do surveys, they say that they don't open the window because of uh, uh, it's cold outdoor, it's dangerous for the children, there is noise outdoor. So there are many reasons not to open the window. So we, in, in the frame of the, the French Indoor Air Quality Observatory, we, we developed this tool that, that, that is called the, the class air, the classroom air in classrooms. 
this is a prototype, the first picture, and uh, at the bottom here is the, now what is on the market, based on CO2 measurements. And when it's green, you don't need to open the window, but as soon as it turns to orange or red, uh, the windows must be open to, to improve air. And we need to take into account energy also, so as soon as it is back, you need to, to, to close the window. So it was developed more than 10 years ago, and now it's used in the frame of the pandemic. Many classrooms are equipped now with this, uh, um, these devices measuring CO2, and hopefully this could be good that after the pandemic, we still uh, keep this equipment in classrooms to improve uh, the window opening. And so we tested this, uh, these tools in, in bef before putting this uh, equipment on the market. It was tested in, in different uh, studies before, and I show you a study uh, carried out in uh, in the Alps, so in the, in the very in the mountains, so in the very cold climate. So the the school manager did not have any mechanical ventilation, and it was cold in winter. So they did not manage to convince the the teacher to open the window. Uh, so we we tried to, in, to 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 raise awareness to the teachers, and to we use this device, and you see so the results. Uh, on the, the bars on the left part are for nursery schools and on the right, right side for elementary schools. And uh, you see both uh, the, without a strategy and with, without and with. So here the strategy was to use a, a traffic light indicators. And you see that using the traffic light indicator reduce the air stuffiness because uh, what is shown is the proportion of classrooms with the, according to the icon index, the air stuffiness index. And you see that with the strategy, there are a higher proportion of uh, school of classrooms with a, a low, uh, lower CO2 concentration and a, a lower proportion of um, classrooms with a high or extreme uh, air stuffiness. So it was observed for nursery schools and also for uh, elementary schools. And we, we checked that it was statistically significantly different. And we checked that it was not due to the, the weather, uh, the, the, the climate was the same with and without the strategy. And we test actually a second strategy that was a, a, a planning. We, we told the teachers, uh, we, give, we give them a leaflet uh, with uh, the moment to open the window in the classrooms and we asked them to, to, to respect this uh, recommendation and open five minutes every hour or 10 minutes every, every, every two hours. And uh, once again, same efficiency as the um, the traffic lights we also observe that with the the window opening schedule we have a, we we don't have extreme situation anymore we have a high pro, higher proportion of um, of low uh, air stuffiness indexes and to finish I, I want to tell you a few words about the, the french regulation so we have since 2015 implemented a regulation on indoor air quality in schools and not only schools also daycare centers and high schools all the all the buildings with uh, children. So the, the, the building owners has two options. Either it shows a monitoring campaign uh, every seven years. So everything was done to, to improve in the situation, to raise awareness about indoor air quality, but taking into account also the, the costs that, that it is to do measurement and to trying to find the, well, the good balance between measuring but not making new burden on, on the building owner. So the, the, the two options are, are either to do a, a monitoring campaign uh, with um, uh, two chemicals chosen, formaldehyde and benzene. So formaldehyde is the, the tracer of indoor air pollution, indoor sources. Benzene is considered as, as the tracer of outdoor air pollution, traffic ex, uh, exhaust. And uh, since we cannot measure all the other pollutants, carbon dioxide is chosen as a, an integrated indicator as I, I, we were, as I was mentioning, it, it's the air change rate, it's a tracer of ventilation and air change rate. And uh, tetrachloroethylene was added for schools close to a um, um, dry cleaning shop. If, if the school or daycare is close to such a shop, we know that they are still using uh, tetrachloroethylene as solvent, so this pollutant is added. So the measurements are done every seven years, twice a year. Uh, and I will show you in, in, on the next slide the values to which the measurements are co compared. And the second option is for the, the, the school manager that have less, um, less money, less, less, um, 
uh, that are less wealthy, they can only do a, a check, they have a checklist and they can do a building audit. So there is a guide published that helps the building manager to, to check the sources, to check uh, if, um, uh, if, if there is a traffic close to the school. So it, and it identifies some, some points that could be improved to, to improve indoor air quality. In both options, you need to, uh, people need to make an evaluation of the ventilation, see either the mechanical ventilation or if the window are openable, uh, for example. So this, this um, regulation is now in place in, uh, in, in the kindergartens, elementary schools, and also high schools since last year. And uh, the, last the next buildings that will be targeted with this ventilation are uh, swimming pools, and um, um, also uh, prisons are also targeted and uh, not only children, places with children, but also elderly homes will be targeted, will be included in the regulation in, in, next, in two years, in, 2000 and, uh, in 2023, sorry. And there are so two sets of guidelines, when, when the building owner chose the, the, the measurement, there are two sets of guidelines value. Um, first, so the measurements are repeated at two seasons, one, in some, one, one, week at two, one week in summer and one week in winter. So for each week of measurement, what, whatever it is, winter or summer, the guideline value for formaldehyde is 100 microgram per cubic meter, for benzene is 10 microgram per cubic meter, and for carbon dioxide, the, the value is, uh, the icon index must not be uh, equal to five. And in this situation, when these values are exceeded or rich, uh, it's mandatory to identify a source in the building within a month and the measurement should be repeated. So, because formaldehyde is rarely measured over 100 microgram per cubic meter, it's the value of WHO. And also, and benzene similarly is rarely above 10. And it, if it's above 10, it means that there is really a, a big problem and it must be solved rapidly. And once you have done the measurement at the two season, people calculate the average and the average must be compared to another set of guidelines value. Uh, it means 30 microgram per cubic meter for formaldehyde and two microgram per cubic meter for benzene. In that case, if it's exceeded, there is no urgency, but the occupants must be informed and the uh, emission sources must, the sources must be limited as far as possible with uh, buying materials with the A plus label, for example and checking the ventilation also must be, must be done. So, and to finish, as uh, Paul was mentioning in the introduction, I'm currently the president of ESIAC, so I, I, I do a, a little bit of advertisement. We have two, two conferences soon. Uh, so in 10 days, we have Healthy Buildings Europe, but maybe it's too late for you to, to participate. So if you miss next Healthy Buildings Europe, you can attend next November Healthy Buildings uh, America uh, in Hawaii. And, um, and if it's not, not possible to travel this year, maybe um, there will be indoor air in, in Finland next June. So I invite you uh, to join this conference and I hope to have the, the pleasure to see you there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Corinne. <coughs> the very interesting uh, set of data that you have. And I'm very impressed by the uh, by just your general approach to, to the whole problem. It's, it's uh, good to see. So uh, I have a few questions in the chat, um, which I'll go through first of all, and I hope that's okay with you. So the first is from Douglas Booker, who just asks about the results and says, do they relate to school hours when you me measure or through the whole week of the school? Yeah, it, it depends. Uh, the, the passive samplers were measured including, including nights. So we, we know that children are not at school during night, but with passing sampling, you, we tested uh, the, to, to close them, but it was not possible. So passive sampling are done uh, continuously from Monday morning to Friday afternoon. But for PM 2.5 and semi-volatile organic compound, we, we sampled only during the day, the school, during the, the school period, and the nights were excluded. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And sort of still on the, the um, analysis of data, uh, Prashant Kumar asks, is the VOC analysis uh, done via passive samplers in the lab? Yes. Uh, all the, we, don't, we don't have online measurements. We're not using um, sensors that, that give online results. We, everything, all the sample 
all the sample, samples are sent to lab and the VOC were sent to uh, the CSTB lab in, in the south of France. We have uh, an analyzed through G, G, uh, GCM, GCMS analysis. Yeah. Right. We have, we have, we have, we have, generally we have one lab per parameter. So VOC and aldehyde were analyzed by our lab. The semi-volatile organic compounds were analyzed in a lab in, in Rennes. Uh, NO2 and PM2.5 were analyzed by two different labs in Paris. So all the samples after each survey are sent in uh, refrigerated uh, packages to, to the two different labs and analyzed within uh, the, the two weeks, maximum one month after the, the sample. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Two questions sort of related by uh, Paul Ajaboy. I mean, he, I should repeat it. He says an impressive study, which I agree with. Would you be trying to draw any links between carbon dioxide concentration, indoor environmental quality in general, and the performance of children in classrooms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good idea. We wanted to do this to to compare the indoor pollution with performance of school, but we were not authorized to do it because we, in the survey, we did not collect the, the school note or the, the exam results. So we asked to the education minister to have access to, for the schools where we did the survey, to have access to the notes. And um, they, they didn't want to share this data with us because uh, they considered that we are missing some information, important information, we, because we, we don't have questions questionnaires to the children. So we don't know the socioeconomic level of the parents, if they, if they are sleeping late or if, they parent, if they are, the children are taking pills or on other medicines. So there, there were too many confounding factors that should have been taken into account for such a study and that, was, that were not accessible. So we, we didn't study the, unfortunately, we, we would, <laughs> would have loved, but we could not because uh, we didn't have access to the notes and we were missing too many, too many data, too much right. data. Yes, I mean, I realize it's hard to make those kind of connections, isn't it? And um, because there's so exactly. many variables as well as indoor air quality and mm -hmm. so on. And it's, and very, it's difficult to organize such a survey. So adding, uh, we, we are always asked to, um, why did you not collect, why, why did you not collect data on children health or health of the teachers? But, um, or take blood samples or urine, but it's, it's difficult to, to do all these measurements. So adding more data, health questionnaire is more ethical approval and it would have been too complicated to add uh, questionnaires or, or taking blood samples or urine samples would have been really, really complicated. That's why we are only describing in our environment, but not health of the students, the pupils. Sure. <clears throat> and Paul also asked sort of, sort of related questions about your traffic light signal for opening windows. And he said, what, what, are the, what are the criteria for going from green to amber to red? We are using two, yeah, two, two levels. Uh, in France, the, the CO2 guideline value is uh, 1,300 ppm. Uh, mm -hmm. So before the pandemic, now the value should be lower. But before the pandemic, the guideline value of CO2 must not be, uh, that must not be exceeded is, is 1,300 ppm. So the two thresholds we are using is 1,000 ppm. Turning from, from green to orange is over exceeding 1,000 ppm. And turning to or from orange to red, is, uh, to, is the concentration is higher than 1,700 ppm. So the, the 1,000 and 1,700 1, are sort of framing the guideline value, the mandatory value. That's why we have these two thresholds that, uh, that allows turning to orange and then turning to, to red. And, is, and sorry, I missed, I missed what you said. Is, is that pre-pandemic or as a result during the pandemic? Pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, because now the value, the CO2 value recommended in schools is 800 right. ppm. So it's much lower. It was yeah. I mean, I think we're thinking of similar values here for, for mm -hmm. from the point of view of infection mm -hmm. risk mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, Henry, you have your hand up. Why don't I let you ask a question? Thank you. Sorry, I'm on a touch screen, so I, I, I just couldn't face typing it all out. Colleen, that was a, a fascinating uh, talk, and um, I was really interested in, in a whole lot of it. I will be sending you an email, but... Um, in particular, we've 
the government here has been thinking a lot about um, the extent to which to recommend and, and possibly even fund CO2 monitoring in schools. Um, and I think there's a lot of data out there about CO2 levels in schools and, and, and some data about the implications. To date, until your talk, uh, I hadn't seen any information about um, how occupants might respond to, to knowing their CO2 levels. Um, and I particularly liked the, 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 the other slide you showed, which was about sort of telling them when they should have their windows open. Um, the data on that slide, you, you seem to categorize it into um, five classes from none to extreme, I think it was. And yeah. I just wondered what exactly those classes were. Uh, yeah, so you see on the screen, yeah, we are using the same. Ah, uh, okay. The, the threshold I mentioned for the, when you have the traffic lights, we have these two thresholds, 1,000 and 1,700 ppm. So right. the categories, were, actually, we did, a, we did a lot of measurement and we did a lot of studies to analyze um, what is the best. Is it six? We have six levels, so we tested five levels, three levels, four levels. We, said we tested different thresholds here. There were many tests, and at the end, we concluded that uh, these six levels with these two, these two thresholds were the more, uh, the, we, were the more discriminant, the more relevant for it. The, the classrooms were um, equally distributed, more or less, in these categories. So that's why we, we, did, we did a lot of data analysis to come to this, uh, these six levels and these uh, thresholds but it's not connected to health or school performance or um, physio physiology of occupants. It's, we hypothesize that more CO2 there is, the, the worst is the indoor air quality. So the idea is to, to reduce the more, as, as far as possible to reduce CO2 concentration. And just very quickly, um, you, you showed that, you know, both strategies had a positive impact. I just wondered, over what time period that was and whether you felt that actually that impact would be sustained over periods of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good point. The first study we did, we studied one week without, one week with the traffic light indicator and one week without. And it's too short. The, we observed that with, with the traffic light, the air stuffiness was reduced. But as soon as we were removing the traffic light, the third week, the, the teacher was having, again, his bad habits and not opening the window. So when, it's too short, one week. When, in the result that I presented you, it was one month without and two months, uh, it, was, it was longer. And uh, we, we asked to the teachers three months later, did you keep uh, your habits? And uh, most of them, not all of them, but they, they, some of them were keeping their habits of window opening. So you're right, we, it's a question of um, habits and it must be long. People must be trained with the traffic light to, to, to have an, so that it's automatic to open the window. And it's, if you don't have this traffic light and if you have it too short, on a too short period, you, you, don't, you don't change your habits on the long term. Thank you. So I'll just be more... dropping you an email. Thanks, we asked the teacher if they were preferring some noise, uh, not noise, but if they were preferring a, a music or a sound, and most of them were preferring the, the, the visual indicator. Right. And some, uh, there is always a proportion of teachers that disagree, so maybe 10% were complaining because it was distracting the classroom and uh, some pupils were wanting to open the window as soon as it was turning orange. So. In some cases, the, the teachers were not satisfied, but a, a, a minor, uh, it was a, a small percentage. Yeah, you can't please all the people all the time. Exa exactly, if we manage to <laughs> raise awareness in a, in a more in a half of the people, it's already good. <laughs> yes. So while we're on the ventilation subject, there's another question here from Paul Sesh saying, Harvard Chan's Healthy Buildings Program is urging us to provide 
ventilation rates of around 18 liters per second per person. Given ventilation rates in classrooms in France and the UK are low, do you have any thoughts about how we address that challenge? Uh, no, that we are. Uh, I would say that what we observe is when you have a, a mechanical system, it's, it's easier to, to, add, to, to reach this value. So, yeah, having a mechanical system, we show in this, uh, when I didn't say this, but uh, when we observe the group of pollution, we, 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 we combine this group of pollution with the building characteristics. And what we observe is that the, the highly polluted classrooms are old schools, not maintained, and without mechanical ventilation, and um, and uh, in rural areas. So, and the, the the schools that the classrooms that are low polluted are equipped or all equipped with mechanical ventilation system. So it's clear that we should have mechanical ventilation. It's better, and we we could manage to reach this uh, air change rate uh, this, uh, with mechanical system. Right. But maybe we need also to save energy, so we cannot maybe cannot install everywhere this mechanical ventilation system. So I would say my opinion, my personal opinion, is it's a case by case situation. Not all the classrooms in the country needs to be mechanically ventilated. There are some places that that are not polluted, where maybe the, the building design is so that it's easy to open the window with no risk. So in in these classrooms, we don't need mechanical ventilation. I don't know if I reply to your question. But... I think, yeah, that's perfect. And just, I think, a final question, given the time, uh, both from, from Sarah West and from Prashant Kumar, just asking about the source of PM uh, inside schools since there's no combustion taking place. Do you, do you know what the dominant sources are? Are, and did and also did you consider a coarser fraction between PM two point five and PM ten, which we, we apparently yeah. are seeing quite a bit of in our measurements here in the UK? We the, the source is the source is clearly outdoor. This is uh, this is a traffic. Uh, all the class all the schools are close to a road because the people the children need to to come to right. school, so they are they are all close to. A, uh, a road uh, sometimes very heavy with heavy traffic so it's clear that it's it's coming from outdoor it's it's fine particle from the traffic and we 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 did we measured the pm10 also but with uh, optical counters and we have not yet analyzed all the data so the the, the standardized method was only used for pm2.5 because it, it right. was we would have loved to measure the pm10 also with a standardized method but it would have been one more pump, and it, it was already a bit noisy, all this equipment, so we could not um, make it too noisy for the teachers, and, the, and the, so that's why we chose to, to measure only one size fraction with the, the gravimetric measurement, and it was PM 2.5. So PM 10 was measured with the GRIM from TSI and optical, and then extrapolated to, to mass concentration. What we observe is PM10, the source are completely different. This is due to risk suspension. And the more activities and the more children you have in the classroom, the higher are right. the PM10 concentration. Thank you. Well, I think we should bring the questions to a halt there. It's been a fascinating talk. And as you can tell from the number of questions, you've raised a lot of interest and presented us with lots of new information and thought, things that we'll think about as we go forward. This brings to an end the seminar series for this uh, term. Uh, we anticipate starting them again after the summer, but just to tell everyone that next week uh, is, next Thursday is Clean Air Day. Um, and there will be uh, presentations uh, taking place uh, on this, in this format but held jointly with the other uh, Clean Air Networks supported by NERC uh, communicate, about communicating clean air research. And just to note that it will be from 12 to 1 next Thursday rather than 1 till 2. And uh, the details and so forth will be sent. I think, um, yeah, Sophie's put a, a link in the chat. Uh, you need to, uh, to link on to um, uh, Eventbrite 
and register. Obviously, it's free to register, uh, but please do so. And as I said, I hope many of you will tune in next uh, week for that uh, important day and this important event as part of our NERC network activities. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, coming uh, today, and again to thank Corinne for a, a fascinating and very uh, inter a fascinating talk. And um, we'll see you all, I hope, at, at our Clean Air Day event next week. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You very thank much. you again. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.